So, tonight I have a 100% exclusive story for you. Written by Drew Stepek. This was originally intended for inclusion in a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights anthology book. But this one was deemed a little bit too extreme to be included. So, very happy to say that it now appears as an exclusive story here for you, my dear, dear listeners. Now, as I mentioned, this is a little bit more extreme than I would normally do, so please consider yourself warned, especially for those of you who are a little bit sensitive to the issues of drug addiction. Well, my dear friends, I think you know what time it is. It's Friday, we've made it to the end of the week, so you deserve to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. Billy Jackson, or Billy Bong as he came to be known was the best friend I ever had. He was always looking out. When I moved to Seattle in the sixth grade from a small town northeast of the city called Winthrop, he beat up some bullies that were messing with me on my first day at school. After they retreated, he gave me my first smoke and introduced himself. <laughs> my name is Billy. He laughed as he fired up my first cigarette for me. Don't worry about those idiots. They won't be bothering you anymore. Holding back my coughing, I said, oh, Thanks, dude. My name's Jackson. I just moved out here last week. He patted me on the back, and then literally took me under his wing. Billy was bigger than me, because, well, he got held back a grade, and for the most part, he was a lot smarter than me as well. Since I was an only child, I always looked up to him as a slightly bigger brother. He understood the big city life of Seattle and became my guide. My best friend was always looking out, always sharing every experience he had with me. When we were in the seventh grade, Billy stole a bottle of vodka from his dad and he shared it with me. We both got wasted and then both got in a lot of trouble. My mum and dad got divorced before we left Winthrop, so she was a little overprotective of me. Even though she liked Billy, she saw him as a bad influence. In eighth grade, Billy stole a bag of weed from his brother and a bong, and we both got high for the first time. Check this out, he said, as he tucked his lips inside the water pipe cylinder. He lit up the bowl and sucked until the bud was completely cooked. He closed his eyes and attempted to swallow the entire smoke load. <laughs> Unfortunately for him, he wasn't yet the iron lung that he would eventually become. He puked back into the bong, and the rest became nickname history. Billy Bong was born. Later that year, Billy stole his dad's car and took us on an adventure to a farm outside of the city. Together, we picked shrooms out of cow poop and ran around the fields. It was the first time I ever hallucinated, but not the last. When I finally arrived home the next morning, my mom grounded me and told me I wasn't allowed to hang out with Billy anymore. That didn't deter us, however. We never grew apart. We never left each other's sides. We always experimented together for the first time and appreciated the wonders of the world of drugs. Three days into our freshman year, Billy and I jumped out of school and left Seattle. Our mission was to travel around America, meeting other kids like us and doing as many drugs as we could. We rode the rails for a bit, but that took us into a dark world we didn't really want to be a part of. One night, on a boxcar, I was sleeping when I awoke to find a meth-addicted vagrant going through my pockets, looking for money. Or at least, that's what I thought he was doing. Get away from him, Billy shouted, as he held up a piece of lumber like a baseball bat and swatted at the air. I wasn't doing nothing, the bum insisted. Give me everything you've got, you old pervert, Billy insisted. What are you gonna do, boy? The bum returned. Without wasting a second, Billy smacked the guy across the face with the lumber. And then he pounded him unconscious. Before we threw him off the train, we emptied his pockets, finding a little bag of heroin and a syringe. 
Billy cut the powder in half to share equally between us. And that was the first time we ever did heroin. Yeah, Billy was always looking out. No matter where our food, drugs, booze or clothes came from, they were always shared right down the middle. Riding the rails and seeing America never became a full reality for us. Since it was harder to find drugs and get a fix around rural Washington for two teenagers who didn't know anyone, we returned to the streets of Seattle after only a few months. Even though I imagined that my mum was driving herself insane looking for me, I was loyal to Billy and promised to never leave his side. And he told me the same. We wouldn't be driven apart. One night, Billy returned to the alley in Pioneer Square that we'd called home for around a week. Somehow, he'd scored us a gram of heroin. We were both excited, because we could do it together, and we didn't have to salvage through junky houses, hoping to find a faded scumbag who left some scag in a needle in his arm or the, or the remains of a day in a bag on their lap. As per usual, Billy split the score in half. Even though he'd done all the legwork to get the drugs... He was never selfish. That said, he always shot first. Billy put the powder on a spoon and started cooking it. You got a better lighter? How did you get this? I asked him as I reached into my pocket for fire. Don't worry about it, he said. As I handed him the lighter, I noticed a dark figure at the end of the alley. What do you want? I called out. I'd been in the alley for the better part of that day, and I didn't see anyone come or go. Shh! Billy stopped, nabbed the lighter from me, and swatted me on the hand. Who are you talking to? He looked toward the figure. There's nobody there. I rubbed my eyes and looked again. It was gone. I must be hallucinating or something, I decided. Uh, you'll be fine once you get a fix, he insisted, as he refired the spoon in his hand. I looked back down the alley. The figure appeared again and began limping toward us. I couldn't make out anything other than the darkness of its form, but it appeared zombie-like as it slowly crept. It crossed under a dying light, and I saw bits and pieces of the ghastly horror. It looked like it was covered in sores and missing skin. One of its eyes was clearly missing from its skull, and its right arm was removed, leaving nothing but a stump. Get the hell away! I yelled a second time, as I began propping myself off my butt with my palms. Billy sucked the heroin into the needle and shoved me. He then grabbed me by the cheeks with his hand and steadied my eyes into his. Bro, you need to relax. I'm almost there. He aimed my head down the alley. See? There's no one there. <laughs> Quit freaking out. I shook his hands from my face and dropped my eyes into my dirty shirt. I used my fingers to rub the outside of my corneas and then spit on my fingers to caress my eyelids. I heard Billy tie off his arm and then grunt as he faded into the world that we chose to run away to. I opened my eyes. Your turn, brother. He handed me the syringe as he fell onto his back, knocking over a trash can. Before I accepted the gift, I looked back down the alley. The grotesque figure was gone again, as if it was never there to begin with. Just like Billy said, I must have been hallucinating. I grabbed the spoon and the remaining heroin off of Billy's leg, and like that, I started to cook myself some dinner. Ah, this is good. He started to choke a bit. This is... Taking my eyes off of the spoon, the figure was back. He was on top of us, standing over Billy. Billy swam around, completely unaware that this disgusting thing was right next to him. The creature raised his head and looked straight toward me. 
His face was practically an open wound, and the missing eyeball flopped over his exposed cheekbone. He opened his mouth, as if to say something, and the bottom of his jaw crunched as it reached its breaking point, falling off the hinges sideways and swinging in place like a pendulum. Worms caught the jaw and quickly sewed it back into place. It stepped over Billy, as if it didn't see him, and came directly into the light above us. Shocked and exhausted, I started pulling myself away from him. Unfortunately, I only backed myself into a wall. I was right. He was missing his right arm, and his flesh was a goopy liquid, opening and closing all over his body. Underneath there were broken bones, seemingly the food for worms and maggots that slithered and inched everywhere inside it. As it bent over to crouch face to face with me, its body parts creaked. Its left knee cracked into pieces as it bent down further. Without waiting another second, I snuck up the wall backward and shoved the monstrosity away from me. Billy laughed and tugged on my pant leg as I started shrieking as loud as I could. Oh, what's wrong with you? He mumbled as his head rolled on his neck. There's nobody here, man. It's right there. It's right in front of you. The monster got back to its feet. The insects inside of it acted as some sort of glue, repairing its broken appendages. It reached out toward me, trying to grab my face. Continuing to scream, I slapped the bony fingers that were dripping rotten flesh. Like a coward, I started running away. Come back here, Jackson, Billy insisted. Oh man, you're just having a bad trip. I didn't say I was sorry for leaving him. I didn't try and save him from the horror. I just ran. I ran up and down Pike Street in downtown Seattle, screaming and crying. Eventually, a patrol car pulled up next to me. Get on the ground, the cop said as he drew his gun. I started to run away from them, yelling, There's a monster! There's a zombie! They tracked me down, however, and nogged me to the cement. One of the officers pressed me face first onto the street, as the other cuffed my hands behind my back. Looks like we have another crazy junkie, the first cop said into a walkie device. My heart thundered through my ears, and everything became blurry. I remember them asking me where I lived. I live on the streets, I originally said. Although, I don't remember doing so, I eventually told them where my mom lived. I was taken home, sedated, and then taken to rehab. They bound me to my bed at the hospital, believing that my rambling about monsters and the lurking inhuman terror from the alley was a sign of drug-induced psychosis. On my first night... I broke the restraints on my bed and tried to escape. I walked slowly to my door, realizing halfway that it was locked. Before I actually reached it to check, though, the decaying figure returned, opening its chest with its still-attached arm and pulling out a handful of bugs to eat. With a mouthful of creepy crawlies, it tried to speak. Nothing came out but grunts and groans and pain. I jumped back into my bed and pulled the covers over my head. I thought that maybe if I didn't see it, it wouldn't see me either. I was right. It never attacked me again like it had in the alley. The next day, as my nurse strapped me back into the bed, I told her where the alley was where I had left Billy. He was attacked by this thing, I insisted. She assured me she would look into it, and even though I asked about him several times a day, no one ever told me what happened to my best friend, Billy Bond. As days turned into weeks, and weeks turned into months, every single time I approached the door, the hallucinatory horror returned. 
like it had before. It reached into its chest, held up what was left of the right, and then feasted on itself. Eventually, they released me from the hospital after I was clean, and I convinced them that I wasn't seeing the thing anymore. Before I was discharged, the doctor and my mum sat me down and told me that on the night I was traumatically running around, terrified in the streets of downtown Seattle, that my best friend, Billy, died in the alley where we had been living. It turns out that Billy Bong didn't die from an overdose. The heroin we were using that day was spiked. No one ever found out exactly what it was tainted with, probably some cleaning product, but the end result was quick and certain. An hour or so after I ran terror-stricken from the alley, the contaminated drugs infected his arm. The cops found him in that same alley, screaming for help, grasping onto his shooting arm and trying to rip into his track mark skin. Even though the doctors thought they caught the infection after they amputated his arm, unfortunately, the gangrene and rot made its way to his brain and his heart. In a matter of days, his skin, limbs, and organs were all corrupted, infected, and, as you can imagine, they eventually melted off of his frame until he died from a blood infection and a cardiac arrest. Yes, Billy Bong was the best friend I ever had, and he was always looking out. So I hope you enjoyed that one. And as I mentioned, that was part of a uh, Kickstarter for Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Uh, the book is now fully funded, as is the second book in the series, and they're currently funding a trilogy of books trying to reach the next stretch goal. So more details of that will appear below the video. Um, basically, um, the books are really cool. Uh, they've got 60 hand-picked authors from Creepypasta, No Sleep, and The Usual Suspects. Some of the big names like Michael Whitehouse, Max Lobdell from UnsettlingStories.com, Matt Demersky, the author of Ted the Caver, which I might get around to reading sometime, Tobias Wade, Chris Straub, of course, who we know is the author of Candle Cove, and millions more. Well, not millions, but quite a lot. Well, each book will have at least 30 stories, and are fully illustrated in a Stephen Gamel-esque style, black and white. So, if that sounds like your kind of thing, please check out the details. Okay, I've been waffling on way too long now. You all have a great weekend, and I will be back again with another phenomenal story for you on Monday. Till then, sweet dreams, and bye-bye.